what we about what we do in my practice, uh, which is not a gentle dental practice. It's a private practice. <laughs> Um, Tim made kind of an intro a little bit. I'm going to go through and introduce myself a little bit more, show you a few different things about me and where I am. Um, I've been in private practice since 1997. I'm a member of Catfall Group, and I will speak a little bit more about that in just a couple of minutes. Um, I'm also a CRCRA evaluator, Gordon Christensen's group since 1999. I'm also current adjunct faculty at UC San Diego. I live in San Diego as well, practice here as well. Uh, I'm an editor for Inside Dentistry Magazine. I've been a CAD CAM user since 2004. I've been placing implants since 2006. So um, a lot of things I'm going to be sharing with you are things that I've tried or I've tested or that I currently use in my office, including the CBCT that we're going to talk about today, especially. Uh, a little bit on catapult education. There's about 25 of us on a normal average weekend. We're typically all around the country and sometimes internationally as well, speaking on um, different topics, whether it's restorative, whether it's um, implants, surgical, different things. But usually we're out and about. Uh, these days, it seems like we're doing way more webinars, obviously, than, uh, than usual. But we do evaluate products. We also write, um, ar write articles. We review articles as well for different magazines. And uh, we do one-hour webinars and things like that on the Catapult website, which I'll share with you in just a moment as well. Here is my contact information. Uh, my email is right there. I'm great by email. If there's anything today that we don't get to, or you have something in mind, or you have some questions later on, or if you ever think about purchasing or looking at any product or anything, and you just want a little information on it, I'm more than happy to share uh, my knowledge and anything I can help you with. I'm also on social media, so um, I do post you know, some funny things. I try to stay away from the politics. I think we got plenty of that as it is. Um, also, that's the Catapult Education website. So if you get a chance, go ahead and visit that. There's some uh, where you can get some CE in there with their one hour webinars. And they tend to be um, pretty good cutting edge type materials and some different things and different topics in dentistry. Uh, I want to open with this little uh, phrase here. My brothers and sisters can so fortunate when all kinds of trials come your way. It's from the first chapter of James, and whether you're a, a religious person or not, I don't think it really matters, but it does truly apply to the times that we're in right now. Um, I really think we do have, um, we are fortunate, we are being challenged, and I think uh, what doesn't, you know, what doesn't destroy us will make us stronger, so I do believe us changing and making some things for the better will be the best for us. And I really do believe sometimes if life is too easy, you're not getting enough trials and I, you don't feel it, but you really do feel fortunate when trials do come your way. Um, I've mentioned in past uh, that I've been doing some in some of the other webinars that I've been spending more time obviously with a family. I've been able to clean my office, have done a number of home projects together. Uh, one of my, my daughter just became a teenager. So it's been fun kind of walking and talking with her and getting closer up. So um, I've really treasured this time and have been able to use it quite a bit. I hope you guys all have as well. I hope you and all your families are well and healthy. And uh, we'll get into our topic here as we start learning. Our learning objectives for today are going to be what sets us apart um, from others. You know, I'll discuss my office and where I'm at and the reason why that's kind of important. But I, I truly do believe, do believe that we do need to set ourselves apart a little bit from other practices. And I'm going to show you some different things that you may or may not want to in your offices. Um, also, we'll talk about integrating CBCT, whether you have the technology currently, you're thinking about it. This will be some things that'll teach you about the technology itself today. And we'll talk about some profitable procedures. Um, I tend to talk a lot about business because I truly do believe that dentistry is a business and I don't think we get enough, enough of a business background when we go to dental school. Um, I grew up in a business. My family had a family business and I was working since age 10. So to me, business is kind of second, second nature. And uh, even though I love dentistry and I love everything it has with it, it's certainly still a business and it has to be dealt with that way. And I'll talk a lot about that and some of the things you should and shouldn't know in terms of your businesses. So let's go through some things. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about change also because change is something that we need to kind of learn a little bit, learn from and adapt to, because in life, I truly believe that you're either changing and growing or it's the opposite, which isn't a very good thing. So um, change is always gonna hit us, whether we prepare for it or not, is in our hands. Um, and usually 
all great changes uh, are preceded by chaos. And think of other chaos as we've had recently in these recent times. So I do hope you're open to change and thinking a little bit outside the box, uh, making some changes within practice. I'm personally using time for a lot of things. We're actually changing some of the flooring in my office. We're doing some different things in there um, because I am taking advantage of the downtime. And this way, I don't have to have the practice shut down for certain times and different things for it. So do consider that this is a time when you can make some changes in your office. Um, I, I do want you to know a little bit about my office as well. So it's important to me when I speak to you that you know what my, my band is. I think a lot of times a lot of speakers come across and you don't know what, whether they practice or not. Um, I practice, I associate. This is my office at the right. Uh, the upper right picture is my room. It is um, not going to look like this once we go back to work. Obviously, we're probably just going to have one or two chairs in the whole thing and remove the whole thing because we're not going to be able to keep people in there in our waiting rooms. Um, some of my colleagues have spoken about the emergency visit or when we first start going back. Um, really, your waiting room is going to have to change what it does and how it works right now. I spoke a little bit about it in the last webinar a few days ago. Um, I'm in a lone standing building, as you can see in that middle picture. And my operatory, as you can see on the bottom right there, um, all the uh, chairs have a TV in front of them and a TV above them for when the patient leans back. Um, I do consider us a pretty good technology office, and I'll share some of that with you guys as we go along. So we do work for uh, four days a week. We have five team members. Um, my overhead's at 57%. That's truly important. For those of you that have overheads over 60, you should really look at your numbers. Um, there's a few numbers that I want you to kind of keep in mind as well. You typically want to keep your overhead under 60%. You also want to know how much it costs you to be open per hour. Um, if you take your information that you're, that's sent to you from your accountant on your expenses each month, divide that by the number of hours you are working, that will let you know how much you are actually uh, needing to produce to be staying open. Now, excuse me, um, the thing you want to know is then start figuring out which procedures you're doing that are actually working well for you and which aren't. And I'm going to share with you some procedures today that hopefully you can start looking into if you're not doing or do more of if you are currently doing that will actually give you higher end type numbers for you. Um, our fees, insurances, procedures, insurance, we do have a couple of PPOs. For those of you that practice in California, you probably know the game. I don't know too many dentists anymore in California that practice um, without PPOs because we've become such a PPO heavy case. And I'm hoping that this um, coronavirus establishes some things and that these PPOs start to change some of their numbers around. Um, you know, something that my colleagues and I have spoken about is having a PPE fee for all our patients because somebody's going to have to pay for all this extra PPEs that we're going to have to be using. Um, a number of my colleagues have already started sending out whether they're videos or emails to their patient. And I highly recommend this for you as well. Telling your patients and telling your um, teams what you're gonna be doing. I'm actually, I have another Zoom meeting this afternoon with my team to go over some of the things we're hoping to do when we get back to work. So um, it's important that you keep track of that, but I'm hoping with these insurance start to either raise some of their rates because some of the way the insurances are set up, if we have to continue working the way we are, if we have to slow down our normal pace because of the PPEs and how our procedures are gonna run, um, you know, some of these PPOs may have to go to the wayside, but that's another topic for another time. Um, procedures. I tend to do most of my procedures in office. We do our own implants. Um, I do some endo. I don't do uh, molar endo because, like I said, we time a lot of procedures, and if it's something that's not going to make sense uh, in terms of profitability, then I don't tend to typically do too much of it. So that's one that I can send out to an endodontist, and I'll speak more about that as we get to that part. Uh, our competition. So I practice in San Diego. Um, San Diego has a little bit over 3 million people. San Diego also has over 3,000 dentists. If you do the math, that's about 1,000 people per dentist. So the numbers aren't great. As we all know, not everybody goes to the dentist. So that makes it a uh, fierce competition to say the least. On my block where my building is right there, within 100 yards, there's eight general dentists around me. So I do have to differentiate our, my office and how do we stand apart? Um, you know, we wanna make ourselves a little bit different. Otherwise we really do become, you know, one of the many and all are the same. So we don't wanna be that. We wanna kind of stand out. 
So if you bear with me for a couple of seconds, I'll show you how we stand out as I just kind of step back a little bit and ask, um, what's been the industry's go-to standard for detecting decay? Um, I think most of you probably agree that it's probably been a sharp explorer since we started practicing for a long time in the beginning of 20th century. But I want to show you a couple of research studies. Research has shown that 40% of caries in teeth that actually had decay histologically were not detected by an explorer. Um, further, other studies have shown that the use of an explorer can lead to misdiagnosis and actually disrupt mineralization or remineralization. So some of these studies have actually asked us to use an explorer because we may be causing more damage than, than good. So um, something to keep in mind. Uh, what's typically been our second line of defense for caries detection? Uh, radiographs, right? If it shows on an x-ray, if it doesn't show, uh, it isn't. Well, maybe not so. So these have shown that about 22%, uh, that they're 22% accurate for occlusal decay and about 52% accurate for an approximal decay. Especially can film cuts and the amount of bad angles that we can um, between you know, DAs and RDHs and things like that, and sometimes they're not retaken. So things are a little more updated here. We have some studies that talk about the detection of periapical bone defects in human jaws using cone beam computed tomography and intraoral radiographs. What this particular study showed from 2009 that um, PAs would only allow identification of lesions 25% of the time. And by contrast, using 3D CBCT imaging, it revealed lesions 100% of the time. And you can see a PA on the left versus the same area using a CBCT uh, five by five on the right. So you can really truly see things a little bit more. We'll talk a lot more about that as we go along. Now, again, getting back to this idea of differentiating uh, my office from others and trying to be different, I'm gonna give a few tips and I hope we'll be able to use them. Again, my tips are things we use in, our, in my practice uh, that make us successful. What, if you'd like to apply them to you, definitely go ahead and do that. I'm happy to share more details with you if you wanna email me. But we take these four pictures on every new patient exam that we see. Um, this does a lot of things. It allows our front office team to also discuss treatment when they go up front. So they're not just talking, you know, without any pictures or anything we see. But this shows us a lot. And I won't typically walk into an operatory unless I see this particular picture sitting in front of the patient. We'll usually leave that in front of the patient for, you know, three to five minutes. Um, and what happens with that? When I come into the room, I'm introduced to the patient. And I'm usually, you know, trying to talk to them about who referred them, where they came from, things like that. Well, this particular patient was in such a hurry. She was like, yeah, yeah, we kind of got you. She's like, what are we going to do about that tooth? And she's pointing to the canine there. So what have I just done all of a sudden? I've got the patient asking for treatment when I've barely walked into the room. It's not like me trying to shove cosmetic dentistry or pushing them into anything, but she's asking for this. With her asking that question, she's opened up a whole new page for us, whether it can be a veneer, whether this is going to be something like uh, orthodontics, whether braces or whether Invisalign or something of that form. She also points out on the uh, mesial buckle of number eight, the little chip there. And she's like, I hadn't noticed that before, but gosh, I need to fix that. And I will tell you, no matter how white their teeth are, and especially in Southern California, when anytime you put their picture of their teeth up on the screen, they think they're not white enough. And so we wind up whitening a lot, about 70 to 80% of our patients' teeth just by showing these pictures. This is very easily done. We take these with a Shofu camera that automatically allows the photo to directly go into um, our dental software using an XFi card so we don't have to take out the actual flash drive and place it into the computer. One of the other things we do with our new patient exam is we use what's called a Camex Triton HD camera by Air Techniques. This camera has, uh, is able to take HD uh, quality photos it also can do fluorescence as well as transillumination. Um, so this can do pretty much all in one that can show you. So we can take photos like you see there in the middle on the left, and then we can do fluorescence, which our hygienist is great at explaining to patients when they have decay in their teeth and explaining what the colors mean. And then we can also do transillumination for some of those kids or parents who don't want their kids to have any radiation whatsoever, or sometimes we just wanna check an area out real quickly. Um, some of you may have carry view. Well, this allows all three types of um, communications for us to show patients. And we really truly believe that pictures are worth a thousand words. So that, that helps us out a lot in our offices. 
Um, and the third thing we do is that we use CBCT. This is our CBCT from Prexion. We tend to use this quite a bit in our office for a lot of different ways and technologies. Um, this is my second cone beam in my office. And uh, I will honestly tell you that practicing with a CBCT just changes your world and how much you get to see in a patient and how much more treatment you wind up getting to see from having a CBCT. And we'll discuss that further as we go along. My challenge to you as dental practitioners would be this. Are, do you think our traditional ways of detecting and diagnosing are effective and appropriate today? Um, the current methods that we're currently using in most practices, would you think that those are appropriate and effective today? Um, how much have we actually evolved? Has dentistry actually kept up with a high tech world? Because we do have a lot of technology out there and a lot of it is moving fairly quickly. You know, we have robotic surgeries being done commonplace now in medicine. And how far have we gone in dentistry? And how much have we gone? How much have we learned? And I kind of would like to talk about the digital world in general. Uh, digital world has become so commonplace where there is so much technology involved everywhere. I mean, it, you know, the funny one is this dog with a GoPro camera. That's actually my neighbor and his dog. And uh, for some reason, he has this thing tied on him all the time. And he's constantly sending me pictures of him. Not sure what the excitement is of the dog having GoPro, but we've got world and uh, you know there's a lot of digitization in the world so it's going to be there and hopefully we don't have too much resistance to technology for some reason a lot of us resist if you think back to technology though technology actually hasn't been so bad it's actually made our worlds pretty good in most cases sometimes it can be a you know a, a, a two-edged sword but if you think about washing clothes back in the old days then came along the washer dryer which changed life for us also, I'm not sure how many of you there are that know what a typewriter is. Hopefully there is a lot of you still, but there used to be the typewriter and the computers came out and basically annihilated that industry. And then I'm sure most of you know what, a, uh, what the phone transformation has been. Uh, that's been tremendous. So it has been quite a bit to say the least. And then now what I, what I think about is going from this 2D uh, imaging of radiographs to 3D imaging, which I think will be the next thing and hopefully bigger movement. Some of us have adopted quite a bit and quite early. And uh, the knowledge and education we get from this is amazing how much we can learn and how much we see in our patients. So, you know, there is a resistance to technology and I'm always curious why. Typically a lot of it can be re uh, related to a learning curve perhaps. Um, sometimes we don't want to, you know, get out of our comfort zone and, and learn new things. But remember that when you learn new things, you grow. And if you're not growing, well, you know the opposite. Um, the other thing may be cost. Cost some, can be prohibitive sometimes, but I think looking at ROI, return on investments of certain things, and what some of those investments will allow you to do in your practices in terms of expansion and some of the things you may be able to do um, can overwrite that a little bit. And sometimes it's just because um, I think, you know, when you just get complacent and you're just happy go lucky going in your world and then we get something like the coronavirus that disrupts our entire lives and world. But just remember that uh, comfort is the enemy of making progress. So I hope you're constantly making progress in your practices. Um, and I believe that we need more accurate and better technology to help us be more conservative and predictable in our diagnostics. And for my techie, for my star techie friends, <laughs> Um, you know what Captain Kirk always said, Scotty, we need more power. So let's discuss that a little bit as we talk about radiographic imaging, uh, which I think is the backbone of accuracy in implantology and our practices in general. You know, our radiographic exams um, basically have been a couple fold. They've been PAs and panoramic x-rays. Um, well, what's with those? Well, they're convenient. They're also fast. Um, they're pretty inexpensive. You know, there's very few offices now. Supposedly there is less than 10% of the offices out in the U.S. that still have um, non-digital x-rays. Um, they're two-dimensional, but they're not as accurate. You know, uh, panora panos can be up to 25 to 30% uh, with some distortion in them. Now, CT or CT scans or CBCT, I believe will become the standard. They are the standard of care for implants, but I believe they will become the standard of care and also standard of safety. Um, one of the things that's pretty important is looking at that picture on the lower right there, you can kind of see what the dental assistant will be doing taking a scan. This is um, truly important, especially nowadays. The last thing I would want is for my dental assistant to be going in and out of the mouth 
um, during this coronavirus time when we start getting back into our practices and taking 18 different uh, x-rays for an FMX. Meanwhile, we have such an easy procedure where we can just sit there basically, have the patient stand inside of that machine for less than a minute, and within a minute after that, we can have the entire scan be done and up on our screen in our computers. So it can be very fast, very convenient, extremely accurate, multidimensional. Um, I think this is going to be the best way to do things, especially considering emergency patients nowadays. Um, emergencies have gotten pretty important and pretty big, and I'm getting like three to four calls of emergency patients these days, and I'll discuss that a little bit further as we go on. So what is CBCT? Uh, we've been using that term quite a bit. It, it stands for Comb Beam Computed Tomography. This was first introduced in, the, in Europe in 1996 and into the States market in the 2001. Um, I believe it's the most significant technological advancement in imaging that we've had in a long time. Um, to me, it's truly the ability to diagnose and be able to see full mouth and understand what exactly is happening within the patient and their entire uh, oral structure. Um, I call it the ah and the aha, because you're going to awe your patients with what you can show them, and you're going to be saying aha when you decide and determine things that weren't being able to be found by other dentists. Uh, extremely accurate information, up to 0.1 millimeter, which can, it's about as accurate as you can get out there. Um, Three-dimensional images of the sites, which is pretty great to see, because a lot of what we, we've been looking at had been 2D, two-dimensional. You can assess bone, infection, decay. You can really look at a lot of anatomical structures such as nerves, sinuses, bone concavities. You can learn a lot and be able to see a lot of this and rotate the entire head and mouth and look at every angle that you want to. Um, it also helps in planning with uh, placement via planning software for implants. And also if you, have, um, if you have digital impression machines, you can really work with the software to show both hard and uh, soft tissues. So there's a lot you can do with this. Um, sometimes we get asked by the patients who get a little bit nervous when we tell them we need to take a CT scan and they've had CT scans from the medical end. You know, they typically ask us, oh, how is this gonna be? Is it as much radiation? Um, typically we tell them that, you know, using this uses a cone shaped type beam. So uh, the field of view that acquires it, it's gonna get it in rot rotation. And essentially you're gonna have about 40 to 60 times less radiation than you would with medical CT. So um, that's another way of doing it. Tim, I think you might want to mute the others for a little bit there, Tim. Um, okay, so again, so cone beam technology versus panoramic imaging. If you lay the letters down, um, if you think of letters and you lay them on top of each other, basically superimpose them on top of one another, that's what you're doing with a 2D image and trying to look at it as a panel. You're typically going to have about 25 to 30% um, of distortion within these. If you look at these flat images, which, you know, allows you to miss a lot of details. What happens with CBCT is you're able to take out each one of these letters and diagnose it really accurately because you're able to take one out and look at it in multi-dimensions. Take each of these letters out and look at it in multi-dimensions, which shows you a lot more accuracy and you can see a lot more with this. Um, also, a little bit more on the limitation of 2D, you can kind of see the woman there is holding a pineapple in one hand, but what limits you is the ability to see what is she doing with the other hand. She's actually holding a banana in the other hand, but if you can look at her shadow there, you don't see that at all. So do we need more views? I think we do, because a lateral view of the prince looks like he's not being very nice to the reporters and to the common folk in England. <laughs> well, when we look at the other view of him, maybe he's not being so bad after all. So I do think we need more views and that's one of the things that CBCT allows us to do. Um, a lot of people always ask me, well, where do you use it in dentistry in your day to day? Um, I think that's important to know and understand. So I'm gonna share those with you. Obviously for implant placement. I'm not sure how many of you place implants. If you don't, I would highly recommend that you look at it as something to be done. Gordon Christensen himself. himself, 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 himself. Gordon Christensen himself has said that um, most general dentists or general dentists should be doing 50% of the implant dentistry um, and the other 50% can be sent to specialists if you don't, you know, desire to do everything in there, but 50% can be done by general dentists. So this is something that you should look at, maybe look at your education. Um, I have a webinar in a couple of days talking about implants and how you could start incorporating them into your practice. 
But this is something that obviously you'll want to take some hands-on courses and take a few more courses before you start doing and maybe place a, an implant on a live patient. Uh, again, if you'd like more information on that, feel free to email me or we can tell you more about it at the end of the course. But foam beam for implants is an absolute must. If you're planning, if you're doing implants currently and not using a CT scan, um, you could be, you know, hopefully you never wind up in court. But if you do, the first question they typically ask is, did you get a CT scan on a patient? So hopefully you're all doing it with CT scans because that part has become the standard of care. Um, cone beam for endo treatment and diagnosis. So every endodontist I personally know now has a cone beam. My old endodontist used to not, and I had one, which was a little bad, but I used to always send them the, uh, I'd send them the little uh, uh, scans and I'd send them just a portion of the scan where the tooth was gonna be. And I would tell them, I go, hey, this molar has a MB2, so make sure you fill it. I think he eventually just got sick and tired of hearing that from me. <laughs> so uh, he, he eventually bought his own. He told me, okay, don't send them to me anymore. I know, I know. But, but um, I think most endodontists nowadays have them because they wanna be able to treat, diagnose, and see how, many, how the canals look. I'm gonna show you some pictures here in a few minutes and you'll be able to understand why. Um, cone beam and decay diagnosis. I will show you some slides here with some decay in there and you'll be able to see them. And you can, the great thing is um, the axial view, you can literally, I mean, you slice through the tooth section by section until you see that decay, how deep it is, where it is, and how far down it goes. Uh, way more accurate than you would with a PA. Cone beam for third molar extractions. Um, whether you do your own third molar extractions or you refer them, or sometimes you do them, sometimes you refer, this allows you to truly see where the nerves are. Is this something you wanna tackle? How much bone is around each tooth? It'll really allows you to give that detail. Whether you wanna sedate the patient or not. So, you know, those are all things and considerations that you'll wind up having to do before um, speaking with your patient. Cone beam for TMJ treatment. And diagnosis. I'll show you a few great slides in there that show you this. Not sure how many of you do TMJ treatments, but if you do, a cone beam is very, very helpful for these as well. Um, apicoectomies, you can always see how well they were done, whether they're still having issues or if there's still infections around them. Sometimes you can track them after they're done as well to see whether the infection is disappearing over time. Diagnosis and treatment of impacted teeth. Um, so this is something whether you decide to do ortho or not, or whether you just want to track and see where these impacted teeth are, and, and whether it's in kids or in the um, uh, multi-mouth uh, stage where they have uh, baby teeth and adult teeth. These are all things that you can see and know exactly where the teeth are. And obviously from occlusion and ortho planning. So ortho plan, those of you who do ortho understand how important this is. Um, to be able to look at the joint, to be able to look at the entire mouth, um, look at all the teeth. You know, now we're starting to look a lot into the sleep uh, aspect of it as well, because that can really play an important part of it in terms of how deep is their palate and how much is that pushing um, on the bones up in the nasal cavity and some of these others. So a lot of this is tied into each other and you can really break down a patient just by looking at their CBCT. Um, cone beam for periodiagnosis and treatment, I will show you a slide on that and you'll be able to see infection, you'll be able to see different formalities where you can kind of tell where the perio disease is starting and where the issues are in there. Um, bone graft procedures, for those of you that don't do implants, this should definitely be something that you absolutely should do and I hope you do because um, outside of wisdom teeth, I think most that you wind up extracting, extracting should be grafted so that you can give the patient the option of an implant or not, hopefully you are. Um, this is a very simple thing to do. You can take some courses on it and you can really, you can really increase some of your production in terms of after extraction, grafting the sites, um, even if you decide not to actually place the implant. And um, sinus lifts are a little more involved, but that could be your next extension after you do implants and start placing your own implants. And cone beam for treating airways, this is because much larger um, out in our dental industry. So this is very important. It's important you get a, a unit that can show you a lot of things and that it has an airway program with it. And I'll share that with you as we go along today. And cone beam for new patient exams and emergency exams. So um, we've pretty much gone to having most of our new patients take a, and, and I evaluate them a lot of times because I do have to tell my patients, or I do have to tell my team whether we want to take a, um, a sleep type CT or a, a regular standard CT. And I'm gonna show you those so you'll understand that a little bit more for new patient exams. 
but even nowadays, especially with this COVID-19 situation, um, take, take going in and taking PAs or x-rays inside the mouth, I mean, we, I'd much rather have them put them into the machine, stand them there for one minute, and then bring them back in. And less than a minute later, we already have all the information we need from a scan in there on all these emergency exams. Um, I hope you guys are all, by the way, answering your emergency calls. I keep hearing, I've had a couple of colleagues who say they're not answering back. And I, I, I'm getting, like I said, three to four phone calls a day um, from new patients looking for an emergency dentist. And I hope you're doing some teledentistry as well, because it's really important out there to take care of these people. Um, I, I've had some of these callers tell me, hey, you know, I've been calling my dentist, calling, calling, and they don't return my call. So I really want to thank you for that. To be honest with you, I haven't gone into the office to see but maybe one person since I've been doing this, since we've been off for all these weeks. The rest, it's been all either placing them on antibiotics. Um, if it's not a day where we may be going in, I've had them go. There's an oral surgeon who's been open there. Um, my MS tried to open for uh, a day, and then his staff kind of <laughs> decided that they're getting paid more for staying home, unfortunately, right now in California than they would be to go back to work. So that's something we're struggling with, and I hope you, that works out on all your states. But it's something that's a little bit of a mess in California. But my point is, be, be able to call them. Sometimes you may be able to just maybe put them on an antibiotic and just put them back a week or two until you can get back into your practices. Um, but just calling and speaking to these people, you know, it's just being helpful. And that's, what, that's something we took with our Hippocratic Oath. So I hope you're all doing that and taking care of your uh, patients and the people who will need help. Let's see. Okay, so what are we looking for in terms of diagnostic accuracy? When we're looking at an ideal CBCT image, what are some of the things that we want? Well, we want some really good density and contrast. If you look at that picture on the right, you can see some really nice detail of the teeth. You can really start to see what's going around it. And that's with it being stable and you're looking at it in 2D. Imagine being able to turn it, being able to look at every single angle from inside the mouth, underneath it, from above it. Um, you're able to do all that while turning the mouth out and basically like holding, mouth, holding it in your hand. Um, you want good sharpness, very good resolution. Um, you want minimal to artifacts or noise. Artifact or noise comes from when the patient has crowns, and especially metallic type crowns, then you're going to get this bounce back from the radiation that hits the teeth and it bounces back and it makes the area look really cluttered and it kind of takes away from some of our detail in there. So you want to find a unit that has excellent, excellent resolution, which the Prexion unit does, and I'll talk about that later, but that allows for minimal to no artifacts or noise. Also, the speed of the scan is something that's very, very important. Um, I was, before the break, I was at my orthodontist's office for my daughter and he had taken a scan on her um, and, you know, we we're sitting there talking and, and going through some things and I kept on like, okay, let's see the scan. Let's see the scan because he had a different machine. And he kept saying, oh, it's not up yet. Hold on, hold on. This was like four or five minutes later until this thing came up. And I told him that that drove me crazy. I'm like, oh my gosh, I wouldn't know what to do myself if I had to wait that long until I got to see it. So speed of the scan is pretty important, at least to me. I like to find things quickly and be able to get to it right away. Um, but we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit further as we go. I want you to understand a few other things too. Understanding some CBCT terminology, um, what field of view, what some of the image components are, whether you have a machine now or looking at one from the future, these are important to know and understand. One of the first things is this field of view. Um, field of view, Field of view is um, dependent on a few things. It's on a detector size and the shape. So if you look at that small one on the left, the first one on the left, that's basically a five by five feature. And I'm gonna show you some of those in a little more detail in the next slide. Um, the one that we typically work at and what most people tend to work from is the complete oral maxillofacial area. That's that middle one. Now, for those of you who are into ortho or doing reconstructive type surgery, you're gonna want a larger field of view. And I'm gonna share those with you and you're gonna see some different details on these. Um, the five by five is the one I'm showing you there. That's really effective for endodontics. A lot of endo, uh, endodontists tend to take this. And even a lot of um, my colleagues who do implants and just want to focus on one little area, you know, I always get the dentist. I also teach a hands-on implant course, implant placement course, where we place a uh, implant on a live patient on the last day after the two or three days of our course. Um, but a lot of them are really worried about what are we going to, what, what if there's so much information, I miss something. Well, so this is sort of a field where you get a five by five, a little small section of the mouth. 
is a good one for you to start on if you're really that worried about it. My recommendation has always been to, you know, take the normal full one that we like, and that's that comprehensive diagnosis of the 10 by eight that's in the middle, um, because that lets you do a lot of things and it can really let you do some um, implant surgeries. It can let you diagnose treatment plan very well. Um, so you can really be able to do a lot and you will learn like anything else. Uh, you know, I always tell people, it's sort of like when you did your first crown. Do you remember that day in dental school? You know, the underarms were perspiring. It took three hours to do a single crown. You had to go get the professor to check it every two minutes, you know, to check the next step up, et cetera. Implant dentistry and doing, looking at CBCT also is somewhat like that. When you first start, it's kind of daunting just looking at it, but like everything else, a little bit at a time, you will start to get better and better with the reading these. Um, for those of you who also still worry about that, we use, there is, um, Dr. Parashar is a colleague of ours and he runs a, um, he is a radiologist, a dental radiologist. Um, his office, if you send them your actual scan within two to three business days, they will send you a full report on your patients from A to Z. They will look at everything for you. On occasion, when there are a couple of things that I'm not sure about, I will send that to him even nowadays, just to kind of make sure I'm not missing anything with them. Um, I have a colleague actually in New York who he sends, he takes every one of his scans and he has Dr. Parashar's office actually do a full radiology report on each one of his scans for each one of his patients. And then he hands that report to his patients. He feels it's sort of like when you go to the physician's office and you get your blood report or you get different reports from the physician's office. So this kind of gives you a complete book on what's going on in your mouth. Obviously there's a fee for that and he just passes that on to his patients. Um, same with me. If I wind up having a radiology reader, I want to read a radiologist. I usually just tell the patient, I go, hey, there's a fee and I'm just charging you exactly what the radiologist would charge us. Um, it's usually around $100, maybe a little bit less here or there. But it's a very good thing to have. And I will tell you, once you start reading some of these, you start learning more and more where now you start seeing things. And again, you learn more and you understand more. So you don't have to do it all the time if you don't want to. Um, now, a couple more of these views, the 15 by 8, uh, lots of information here. You can be um, oral surgery cases, including multiple implant cases. The 15 by 13 is great for a number of things here. This is for TMJ analysis, um, ortho, dental sleep solutions. Also, I'm not supposed to mention this, but they are going to have a 15 by 16 view even soon. So Tim will probably get mad at me for mentioning this because I can't wait till they get that. Um, that will allow you for even more medical billing of these. And that's another topic we will probably talk about um, in a couple of days when we do our other webinar about implants and medical billing. But um, in medicine and medical billing, you will get paid more for these CT scans than you do in your current offices in dentistry because there's very few insurances who currently pay for a CT scan. There are a few, but not that many. Um, Let's talk a little bit about dose levels. You know, everybody's always concerned about dose levels and hey, how much radiation are you actually giving them? Um, I usually tell people by doing this, uh, by doing a CBCT and look at the rapid dose on like a 10 by eight, the one that we have circled in blue there, um, that allows for 25.2 uh, microsieverts micro there. And at the, compared to an FMX, which, is, which can be up to 160, 170 microsieverts, that's a lot more. Think about it. Even on our standard level healer, 78.3, that's less than half of what it would be with a normal FMX being taken. So what am I doing here? I'm actually radiating them less, and I'm getting way more information. That great information allows me to see a lot of different things within their mouths. Now let's get into it in a little more detail and start discussing the different levels and the different sites and views that we get within our uh, CBCT. I will show you this and then I'm gonna break it down and make it a little bit easier for you. Don't look at this and be, oh my gosh, what is that? How am I gonna learn this? Because we all started at that level. Believe me, when I first started, it was the same thing like, oh my gosh, what is this? I haven't seen anything like this. I'm gonna have to relearn all this stuff. A lot of this stuff is packed away in your head somewhere. It'll all come out little by little, believe me. Um, but a couple of the different images that you tend to see in a CBCT, one of them is the coronal, and that's going from front to back. Basically, it's slicing going from front to back within your face. Um, the next one, which is the really great one that I love, and this is the axial version. This is going from top to bottom and just taking slice wherever you want. As you can see on the right there, you can literally slice the tooth down all the way to the contact points and really show and see, for some reason, my pointer is not working. Ah, 
Hang on one second. We just lost the screen. Hang on one second. Ah, let's see if we can reopen that real quick. And let me get out of that and get us back into our screen. Okay, and we're back. Woohoo. All right, so that's the actual axial version. So what happens with this is that you wind up being able to slice that down uh, as far as possible as you want to the contact points and really see if there is decay within the contact points. And you can really see the bone morphology, how wide and how, you know, a lot of differences within it as you go through if you're planning any implants or any surgical type procedures. Now the sagittal view is easy to remember. Think of sagittal starts with the S, so it's side by side. It's basically taking slices through your face across, okay, hey, from Dr. one Hel side to the other. Um, you can see just this photo that you can see some decay in there. You can see lots of different things within this, within this uh, view. And I'll show you a lot of these together as we kind of go through a little bit further. Dr. Halibo. Yes, sir. We can't see your slides. Oh, I should be on. Share screen. Um, hang I on. I see your face and I'd rather see the slides. Uh, I'm sure everybody would too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hang on. Let me see. Where'd I lose you here? Uh, full screen. We're recording. Uh, share screen. Let's do that. I'll put you back on here. Okay. How about now? Done. All right. Okay. Um, I don't know if you guys missed a slide or two. Did you guys see these slides? Yes. These are important slides. So I'll walk through them real quick again. Yeah, we got to uh, top to bottom and then we lost you. Okay. All right, well, this was, like I said, top to bottom is great. So that's the one that you, see, you can see decay in. You can see how wide the bone is. Uh, really pick out bone morphology in. And you can also just see decay within these as well as you see the contact points as you keep slicing down within the teeth. The next one is sagittal. It's the side to side. You can actually see some decay within this as you look at the right-hand side of the, of the uh, screen. Side to side is very easy. Sagittal is what it's called. And you're just slicing through the head from side to side as you go back and forth. Um, then we have the image quality chain. So this is what I want to talk about a little bit. Whether you have a CBCT or not, um, you need to understand a little bit of this and what's behind them. So I won't get too technical with you, but I want you to understand four main items that to kind of look at in a lot of CBCTs and understand. It's focal spot, voxel, projections, and data reconstruction. So let's start with the first one. Um, the smaller the focal spot, the sharper the image is. So that's a big thing to understand. If you look at the two photos on the right, one has a 0.33 millimeter focal spot. The other is, is 0.5 millimeter focal spot. If you look at them both, you can see, and I hope you can see that the 0.3 has a much better detail on it. So again, the smaller the focal spot, the sharper the image is going to be, the better detail your scan will be. That's a huge point. You want as good a scan as possible. You want to be able to really see that fine detail, okay? Because that allows you to really measure and be able to see that decay and be able to measure that bone and be able to see exactly where that nerve runs and things like that. So the more detailed you are, the better it is. The next item is going to be voxels. Now, a voxel is essentially a three-dimensional pixel. You all know what a pixel is from your TV and how many pixels it has or any screen that you look at. Well, a three-dimensional pixel is considered a voxel. Again, with voxels, the smaller the voxel size, the, the more detailed the image is going to be, okay? Um, if you think about this, the smaller the voxel size will be more like a 4K type quality TV. Um, the, the larger the voxel size, the quality goes down each time, whether it's HD or just standard quality TV, okay? Now, the third item we want to look at is projection volume. So the higher volume of projections allows for more angles to be captured along the teeth. So if you can capture with a lot of different um, projections in one swoop around the, around the patient, then you get a lot more detail. So the more 
um, the more projections you have, the better image quality is going to be. So that's another important feature to look at when you're looking at CDCTs. And the last one is this data reconstruction. I kind of touched up about this on this a little bit at the ortho office, but um, Prexion has its own server. So it allows for them to really reconstruct the data very quickly and allow that to come right back onto your computer screen in any one of your rooms. It usually occurs within less than a minute, which is a great thing because it puts that software and gets it running quickly once it takes a scan off the patient. That's something that's really important because you don't want to sit there and wait and wait and wait, especially if you've got a busy practice where you're trying to get things going and moving. Um, so begin to look at your patients the way you treat them, which I believe is, you know, is in 3D. So the more you learn, the more you see in 3D, which I promise you, once you start doing CT scans, you start seeing so much more, especially in terms of like endo failures and you start to see areas that are decaying or like, um, some different tissue areas or like shadows within areas underneath crowns and things like that. Um, so if you ever want to do more dentistry, let me tell you, getting a CBCT is a way to do it. Um, here are some scans, and these are untouched scans of, of patients we've had um, that, you know, basically you're looking at and you can kind of see what you can, what you want out of a patient. And that axial view in the upper left, you can really take a look and see, look for decay, slice that down as far as you want. I'll show you some other views in particular for decayed areas. Um, the, the one on the upper right, you can really change the different modalities. So you can have that. And I'm going to show you some different uh, views of that. The other three modalities will typically be there always on every patient. Um, you can look at them in other ways where you can start to measure the bone for some of these patients. You can measure the length or the width. If you want to just look for decay, you can in them. If you want to look at their nasal area and look at their fossas and things like that, you can do it as well. It just depends on what you want to do and how much you want to learn and practice and, and do within your practice. Um, let's talk a little bit about implants. The benefit of CBCT is to look at that axial view that I mentioned, which really allows you to pick apart the bone and be able to see your volume of bone very much, your width of bone, how much space you have. Um, because looking at this x-ray in particular, Looking at all three views to fine tune your treatment plan, if you just looked at the sagittal view, you may think, well, I've got a lot of bone length there. That should be plenty good. But then when you start looking at the axial view on the far left, you can see that there's some deficiencies in that bone, especially in the buccal area. So you'd really want to know where you want to put that implant. And so that's an important, really important feature to have before just going in and starting to place your implant without knowing where exactly where the bone is and how it's featured. Um, some of the other things you can do with it within these is you can draw out the anatomical structures, uh, which really allows you to see how far they are and you can measure the distances between them and where you replace your implants in this case. The other great feature that uh, Prexion has is they have software from most of the top implant companies uh, in the world because what it allows you to do is you can place your implants while you're pre-planning. I do most of my cases pre-planning before I get to see this way, when I'm seeing the patient, the actual surgery winds up being about a half an hour. Um, all the planning is done here, whether it's one implant or more. So we do all the planning. I actually place the implants in there, depending on what type of implants you want to place. You get to place them accurately, see where they are being placed within the bone, how far away they are from the nerves and everything else before you actually get to um, placing the implant. Um, let's do a little bit on endo. I, I usually show this with a live audience and ask them, what do you see here? Because the patient came in and they had pain, but you couldn't tell what it was. And if you're just looking at this 2D image, what do you see in this picture? There really isn't much you can see in this. You know, you have to test it and they say they're having some pain. They went to another dentist. Uh, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with them. Told them, let's just wait and see what's going on with it. Well, we decided to take a scan. And this is what a scan can show you. It can show you that fracture within that that you wouldn't be able to see in a 2D, 2D image. Also, in general, I want you to think a lot of times when you see a uh, post in a tooth, especially metallic posts, uh, be very wary that there could be a fracture within those. Um, another one here where we come in and patient is having some pain and sensitivity and we're looking at that 2D image and we're like, eh, well, there could be something there, but I'm not quite sure. You know, it looks like it's filled correctly. So what is going on in there? And then we take a scan and we start to see that lesion around. And you really start to see it in this where you're looking at it and it's not really going all the way to the end. It wasn't filled completely. There's definitely a uh, lesion there around that post. So uh, it really tells us to 
uh, it really shows us where the lesions are with us. Um, this is another one that's very interesting as well. And I always ask, well, where do you, who, which tooth do you think is the suspect one? Where do you think is giving us the issues? Because there is, you know, some endos here. There is a couple of teeth that have restorations in them. So which do you think it would be? And you'd be surprised to see that it's actually the tooth with a post in it again. And yet there is another fracture. But look where the lesion winds up when you're taking a 2D image. Okay. So you have to be very careful with these and understand this. Um, this is another one as well, where you look at this photo and you're like, okay, why is this failing? Because the endo doesn't look too bad and you start to look at it a little bit closer and you start thinking, okay, what else could there be going on? What could be possibly happening in this? Is it cracked? Is it fractured? And then you take a scan and you see that a full canal was missed altogether. Um, one easy way to be able to note this is that axial view, again, can really show you when a, uh, when a full canal has been unfilled. That's a tough thing to, you know, send, especially like when you look at it, you're like, whoa. Um, so hopefully, I think this is one of the other reasons why a lot of endos started getting these, just to make sure they see where every canal is and they kind of see and know where everything is. Here's one of the uh, ones I alluded to earlier in that now you can check and see which ones, uh, where you have an MB2 canal and whether you decide to treat it or not. I don't do these anymore because they take too long, especially if they have an MB2 in them. So God bless you guys if you do, but these are typically being sent out to my local endodontist. And it used to be really fun and get, get on his case a little bit when, he'd, uh, when I'd send it to him and say, there's an MB2, make sure you fill it. Uh, so, um, but it's nice knowing whether you want to keep it in your office or send it out. Um, also, lower anterior sometimes, two canals in a lower front tooth. If you look at that, that's not something you typically see, but you can see it within the, C, uh, within the CBCT in the axial view here, as well as the sagittal. Um, how about root resorption? That can be seen in endo as well. So sometimes you can see it in that axial view on the left, and you can really see it over here um, on the right as well. And you can highlight that and really show this in certain areas and decide, you know, send this to your endo, or if you decide to work with this, what you want to do with this. But you can really highlight these and show them to the patient to show them what is going on with the tooth and why it's going to need to be treated. How about third molar evaluations? Um, doing, this kind of a, uh, doing this kind of a diagram only takes about a minute, and it's really cool to show your patients. And, you know, even based for you, if you want to kind of look at it and decide, hey, is this something I want to tackle? Look at that wisdom tooth, how it's wrapped around that nerve. Uh, if that's something you don't want to do, then that's the one you know that you probably want to send to a uh, oral surgeon. You know, let them deal with sweating out the nerve and everything with this if you don't want to do it. Or if it's something that you do on a regular basis, maybe you might want to think about putting a patient in sedation and, and doing it that, that way. So um, it just allows you more possibilities. You know, and here is third, more third molar evaluations. You can see where the bone is, where that tooth really is hiding up there, which you could never see that with a PA knowing where that is and how you're going to go for it, whether you're going to have to go through some of that bone or not, um, again, allows you to decide whether you want to treat this patient or not, or if you want to, you know, have somebody else do it. Um, third and fourth molar evaluation. Some patients have had fourth molars, so if you haven't seen it yet, you probably will at some point in your careers. TMJ evaluations, when the condyle is removed, um, and the condyle position and just being able to see that condyle and how much of it is worn or how much of it is still in shape and tactically in shape. And inferior views of the fossa um, without the condyle. So you can kind of see what it's doing and where it's at. So that really allows you to treatment plan for those TMJ guys. Um, surgical planning as well. We get a lot of impacted teeth. We get a lot of uh, supernumerary teeth as well in my office. So it's great having this technology to be able to see exactly where that tooth is. Um, sometimes if you want to just sur do some surgical planning and open that up and allow your orthodontist to go in and attach to those teeth and bring them into position. Um, and here is some supernumerary teeth that I was talking about. So you can really see where they are if you decide to take them out or what you want to do with them, uh, depending on the case. Orthodontic planning is another one, obviously, that we talked about. Um, whether you decide you do your own ortho or this is something you want to share with your orthodontist and explain to the parents and show uh, where these cases are, or if this is an adult that you might want to talk to and figure out what they want to do with their teeth, but allows for more possibilities. And a lot of these cases are great because a lot of times when you're able to show some of these cases, you really wind up selling the case on itself because, again, 
pictures are worth a thousand words. And if you can show them what's happening in their mouth and show them in something like this and what it's doing, then a lot of times they're like, oh, geez, I better get this fixed because a lot of their teeth are going to start moving and, and moving into different positions. Um, perio treatment also, I'm going to just go through this. I'm running a little bit out of time. Make sure I give you guys time for some questions near the end. Um, perio questions, um, periodontal defects, and um, you can see within the, we can see within the different views how they can look. I want to show you one where there's also, now this is a pre-prosthetic evaluation one. For those of you that do your own surgeries, um, you always want to know if you have a knife edged, um, a knife edged ridge there and how, whether you're going to want to augment that before starting. I have had cases where I've had to do it twice because you do the first one and it still shrinks and then you do a second one to try and build that ridge up before you can place any implants into it. Um, also airway diagnostics. We talked a lot about this um, last time, but a little bit on it this time in that, you know, the Prexion software comes with this airway uh, diagnostic software, which allows you to measure the volume, the space, within each patient. Um, what's great is a lot of times if I see this before I walk into the patient's room, I'll kind of go in and just look at them. And you know, I'll, I'll typically be like, hey, how do you sleep? And they look at you like, uh, why do you ask? I don't sleep very well. And that's when we start talking about the airway and diagnostics. I'm not saying that I am ruling that they have sleep apnea. Again, we don't make that decision, but this is the start of a conversation where we may have a sleep study done and then we can talk about different modalities. Sometimes they may have a CPAP and they don't like it and I can give them some different options on things. Sometimes it may be where, um, you know, their sleep study comes back and I'm like, okay, you need to see an ENT like as of tomorrow, like look at that patient on the bottom picture there. Uh, Tim, that's someone you and I know. So that's somebody who has a very tight little space there. And that's something we worry about and we want to talk to them about because this person is probably struggling for sleep and getting little oxygen to their brain at times when they're sleeping. So there's a lot of times when they're stopping breathing and the oxygen is going to the brain. And that's a much more involved, involved conversation and not just for today. But I just want you to know that this CBCT does have this capability um, to be able to have this airway diagnostics and you can do medical billing as well. Now we talked about a lot about why to have a CVCT. So let's talk about why not a CVCT. Uh, why would you not? Cost to the doctor is an obvious one. And cost is always gonna be something where you have to look at your return on investment. Always remember, I always think of these things uh, whenever I'm buying equipment for the office is what am I gonna be doing with it? How often am I gonna be using it? In this case, I use this on a daily basis on new patients, emergencies, um, implant patients all the time. We actually advertise for implant patients. One of the things we tend to do is we do a lot of AdWords in our area. Uh, I spoke about how competitive my area is. So we do AdWords and we actually, you know, give them a free CT scan if they do the implant at our office. Um, one of the other ways that we tend to do it um, for our patients too is um, if we have patients that come in like new patients and you know if we're starting with them sometimes we'll just charge them out a pano fee whenever you actually take a cbct especially that eight by ten it allows you to have a digital pano with it as well so technically you are taking a pano and if you want to be nice to your patients which we usually are we just do it as a pano fee i don't mind having that fee when i'm seeing so much information in their cbct that i'm seeing a lot of treatment that we can do on them um, so the other thing maybe also is cost to the patient. So that's some of the things we're talking about. You know, a lot of times if it is a surgical procedure, then, you know, 250 um, is what we normally charge for it. Like I said, some insurances do cover that. Um, a lot of times our patients for implants, this is part of the cost. We kind of package it up. This is going to be part of the cost where you're going to have the implant and everything else in there. So we put it in there as one and it includes your CT scan. And if I need to take another one at another time, I usually don't charge them for the second one. Um, the machine is already there and you're paying one fee per month like we do. So uh, to me, it's just trying to get, you know, single uses out of it. Um, most of the time the charges are in cash and people pay them and that just goes to how much it costs. You know, it's usually that, that fee is paid within the first few days of the week. So, um, you also have a short learning curve. I know we talked about that a little bit. Um, this company is great about having people come out to you and train you. When you first get the machine, they'll come out, they'll train your team on how to work with the machine, how to take the actual CTs as well as you. That'll be the morning half. The afternoon, they'll spend time with just you or whoever needs to learn to read these and they'll teach you a number of things. 
And within a couple of weeks, they'll actually do it again. They'll come out and teach you some more things so that after you've kind of gotten a little comfortable with it and started playing a little bit with it, you'll learn more things. There's also a ton of videos, CE, and they also give you flash drives on different things and different shortcuts for it as well. Um, space in the office is an interesting one as well because in my office, we had very little room. That was my problem is I used to actually send patients to the labs and then um, eventually I started having a truck come into the parking lot and I would send the patients out to my parking lot and get it. That became a little prohibitive too and that a lot of times, you know, the truck was late and the patients would get mad or the patient wouldn't show up and you still had to pay the truck. But having it in your office and being able to use it in, in all the time whenever you want is a great feature. Um, what we eventually did is we made, we took away a little bit of the uh, room for our team that had their break room. Uh, we just took enough room for basically, if you have a pano now, you don't need to make any more room because it fits in the same size as a pano essentially, um, as long as it can go all the way around. So space wise, it takes very little room. So that's another thing that you can do without. Um, and the last course they asked us, which CBCT, obviously Prexion is the one that I use. I find it to be the most balanced CT scanner with the highest specifications. One of the things that I didn't list on here is they have a 10 year bumper to bumper warranty. Now that is incredible in the industry. That is unheard of. No other, no other CBCT has that. Um, so that's one great, great feature to look at. The other things we talked about the resolution in the industry, they have the best image, I believe, because I tested a lot of these and looked at them side by side. Um, their focal spot, voxel size, pixel size, all amongst the very lowest in the industry. Speed of the scan, it's one of the fastest out there. Super easy to use software. Um, customer service is second to none. I work with a lot of different companies and we try out a lot of different uh, service, customer service type things when we're testing out different models of things. They have two different um, service uh, stations, one on the East Coast, one on the West, so they will typically get right on your machine by the next day, they'll be on for sure. If they can't get on there, they will send somebody out as soon as possible to keep you up and running. It's rare, if ever, that our machine is down. Um, and believe me, looking at ROI, this is not the cheapest machine out there. It's certainly not the most expensive, but for the price, I think you get the best of so the 10-year warranty and the highest resolution in there all together. So um, there is lots to do in there, lots to see. If you have more questions, please let me know. Just want to finish with this, that a good life is when you smile often, dream big, laugh a lot, and realize how blessed you are for what you have. Um, I hope you're all doing well and healthy, and I hope you are all blessed as you go back to your practices slowly but surely. Here is my email information, and um, you have been a great audience. And Tim, you can let me know if you have any questions there. Dr. Alba, thank you so much. Uh, amazing. I keep learning yeah. every time I hear this. Um, there is one question. Doctor says, currently have a 2D pano and treatment acceptance is low. Um, what's your acceptance rate with your, I'm going to say, they said CBCT, but I'm going to say with your Prexion. Okay. Um, so, so our treatment rate's pretty high because we kind of have the system dialed in. Between taking pictures of patients and showing them within our three regional, some of the pictures that I showed you, some of the different things where we can show them their mouth, showing them maybe if we want to do ortho on them, we show them where they are. Um, a lot of these things, when they're able to see that, can really raise up their level of, okay, <clears throat> this is, sounds like the place I want to be in. They see the technology. They understand the experience we have. We try to show them everything because I really do believe that pictures are worth a thousand words. And whenever you can show people that, it really kind of puts it in their head that like, yeah, this is probably something I need to do. Um, I'm not saying we're 100%. Sometimes we do it and we just plant a seed with it as well, where we're just like, you know, you really should think about getting the ortho done because there's so much wear on your teeth and look at the way your teeth are working. Look at the bone loss and all the stuff that you see. So sometimes they may not do it right away, but then they come back and our house may show them something. And just little things like that, eventually they just come up and after a year or two, we've had people after a year or two go, okay, I'm ready for that. Let's do this thing that you guys showed me a while back. So I do feel like it went way up. Um, it's not 100%, but it does work very, very well, especially whenever you can show photos, you can show scans and show them before and afters. Does anyone else have any more questions? Yeah. Speak? Hello? We can yes. Hear Hello? Yes, go ahead. This is Jeff. Can you hear Jeff? I'm not sure if you're talking to me. Yes, we can hear you, Jeff. Oh, good, good, thank you. 
So uh, the question I have, uh, I just, I came into this, I just got some information about this. I happen to have an instrumentarium OP300 that I've had for several years. And I'm looking at what you're doing. <laughs> I guess I'm not being, I don't have the same luxury here. Very disappointed. After seeing what you're saying, what you're showing me, um, I've had a, you know, not too pleased. So what are the options for someone like myself? You know, how does that play out? Is there upgrades available for this unit? Or, or I guess selling buy this one. I don't know. You know, I don't know what Tim, the option. Do you want to take that? Tim, you could probably hint, answer yeah. that better than I can. Doc, if you don't mind um, texting me on the text line, your phone number, and I can reach out and get you a hold of one of our distributors that uh, some of them have, they'll buy your machine back from you, give you a little bit for it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's funny. We've been really upgrading a lot of machines from different companies. Um, yeah, I'm very disappointed. When, you know, I've always not been thrilled, but after seeing this, I'm doubly, <laughs> you know, it's just like, wow. No, yeah, just um, on, on the bottom under the chat, just find Tim Malding, uh, type you're in your number, and I will call you right after this is over. All right, let me see how do I do, oh, hold on, let me see how I can do that. I'm, no, I'm, it's the first time I've done this. So where would I uh, find you it? You to Zoom, huh, Jeffrey? Yeah, this is uh, actually I've done one other with some company called Dental Post, and I usually do it only on the phone. 